Well, good morning. I see everyone here this morning. I'm glad to be back. It's been two weeks. We had a week of gospel meeting and then the first uh, first pulpit swap that we've done out of three planned for this year. It's intended to be a fun event, something that can encourage all of us to hear the truth as it's being taught in our local other congregations. And so uh, Rob said he was encouraged to being with you all, and I certainly was encouraged with my day at West End. But it is great to be back. Many of you have told me, don't leave again. But <laughs> So that, that's encouraging, but it's, it's going to happen at least two more times this year. Uh, it's meant to be an encouragement to all of us to, to be able to hear the truth being preached and from different styles and different backgrounds, the same as when we bring visiting preachers here for a gospel meeting. But I'm glad to be back with you. This is the third Sunday of the month, and so as our as we're, as our habit, we're going to have a song and scripture service this evening. So men, make sure you tap that back whiteboard and get your name on there for the things that you would like to do this evening. This morning's lesson is entitled, I Heart Barabbas. And it's got an exclamation point, so when you say it, it's intended for you to say it loud and proud. I heart Barabbas. Taking our text from 1 Peter 3.18, and uh, we're also going to be looking at Romans 5.6-10. I want to begin with reading 1 Peter 3.18, and hopefully as we go through this, this title will make a little sense to you. You might be wondering, why would we say we love or we heart Barabbas? In 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18, it says, For Christ also died for sins once for all the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. You know, in a very physical sense, we can look to Jesus' trial and we can see Barabbas being the unjust, and Jesus the just taking his place in a very physical sense. At Jesus' trial, Pilate gave the people a choice. He says, release Barabbas or release Jesus. In Mark chapter 15, verse 10, and Matthew 27, 18, it's revealed to us that Pilate knew why they brought Jesus to him. It says out of envy, they delivered Jesus up. So perhaps out of recognizing their their envious nature, their jealousness of Jesus, that's why he gives them this choice. We also find out that it was his habit at the Passover time that Pilate would release any prisoner the people wanted freed. We can read this in Mark 15 where it spells it out that they were asking him, for this custom. And then it tells us the custom that he would release anybody that he held in custody, anybody they wanted freed. And so he gives them the choice, Barabbas or Jesus. We're going to look at the character of Barabbas a little later on, but to give a spoiler alert, the Matthew 27 account tells us he was notorious. Some versions say well-known. So this, just to give you an idea of what that means, is the people knew the name Barabbas. There might not be much written about him in Scripture, and there's no words recorded for us that he said in Scripture, but he was well known. He was notorious. I've often heard it said that this would be like to the sheriff of Nottingham holding Robin Hood. It would be good enough if he had any of Robin's men, but for to have Robin himself, Robin would be that notorious, that well known prisoner. Barabbas is that well known, that notorious prisoner. And so he gives them the choice. In these several passages, Matthew 27, 15, 18, Mark 15, 6 to 8, Luke 23, 17 and 19, and John 18, 39 to 40, tells us that he was willing to release any prisoner. And he wanted to release Jesus. He wanted them to say Jesus. <clears throat> but it's interesting as we look at the name Barabbas. In Hebrew, it means Bar Abba. We've heard that before. We've heard Bar Jonah. It means son of Jonas or son of John. Here, Bar Abba means son of or son of a or the father. Sometimes because of the way the endearment of the word Abba, it could mean son of a or son of the dear father. And so it's interesting the choice presented before the people. Son of a dear father or son of the father. Jesus Christ was son of the father. And in fact, one of the charges that they bring to Pilate against Jesus is that he makes himself out to be a king. He makes himself out to be equal with God. And so we look at their choice. In Matthew 27, 20 to 26, Mark 15, 11 to 15, Luke 23, 20 through 25, and John 18, 39 to 40, and all the way into chapter 19, verse 15. The people chose Barabbas. And we can see in Mark 15, verse 11, That because he was so well known, 
because he was notorious. It says the chief priests were inciting the people to choose Barabbas over Jesus, indicating that there might have been some in the crowd saying, wait a minute, we know who Barabbas is, let's release Jesus. But yet it says the chief priests were rabble-rousing the crowd to cry out, Barabbas, Barabbas. To the point that Pilate says, then what do you want me to do with Jesus? And we all remember the phrase, crucify, crucify. And it says in some of the passages, they cried out even more, crucify, crucify. The people chose Barabbas. So in a very real physical sense, as we look through the Gospels, we see 1 Peter 3.18 play out. That Jesus, the just, died for the unjust. But let's take a look at Barabbas. And as we take a look at Barabbas, I want to ask you to do something different. I want to ask you to walk in Barabbas' sandals with me for just a moment. And so this morning, you are all notorious. You are all murderers and insurrectionists and robbers. I want you to put yourselves in Barabbas' sandals for just a moment and think about the ramifications of what was happening here. You are well known. Your deeds are well known. Some people might hail you as a folk hero. Some people might hail you as a hero. Remember the zealots. The zealots were also called dagger men. It would be interesting to do a study on the apostles and their relationships. Because we often focus on the fishermen. But we want to think about there was a Jewish tax collector who the Jews often equated with the lowest of sinners. There was also a zealot, James the Zealot. You had Matthew the tax collector and James the Zealot. The zealots, their whole goal in life was to overthrow Rome. They wanted to overthrow the Roman oppressors and bring Jerusalem back to its former glory. They were called dagger men because they often targeted Roman officers and would assassinate them. It is the zealots who began the Jewish-Roman War of AD 66 that lasts till AD 73, resulting in the destruction and burning of Jerusalem in AD 7. Perhaps these are zealots that are rotting in prison, awaiting their death. But you, today, you are Barabbas. You are this notorious insurrectionist. You are a notorious robber and murderer. I want you to think about what he might have been thinking about. As he was sitting there on death row, his trial is over. He's guilty. His trial is over. He's awaiting execution. And think about, perhaps he's in earshot of what was taking place in this courtyard. And you're sitting there behind bars, your hands in shackles, knowing what awaits you. Roman law dictated that if you were under capital punishment, if your sentence was death, that you would be scourged or flogged first and then led to your death. It weakened you and it added to the whole torture experience that would lead to your death. The Romans were great at it. And so perhaps you're thinking about the stripes that were about to be yours. Thinking about that road of shame is after the earth's scourging, you're going to be carrying your own crossbeam, your own instrument of execution through the streets to the execution place called Golgotha, the place of the skull. Your friends, your family, probably other insurrectionists that might have got away are going to be watching you on that road. And then you're going to be lifted up and made a public spectacle as you hang there to die a slow, agonizing, torturous death. The secular historians record could take two to three days unless they break your legs. And you're sitting there thinking of all these things on your mind because you are you have been caught. You have been tried and convicted and you're awaiting execution. There is no hope. There's no last appeal. It's going to happen. And then all of a sudden you hear a shout in the courtyard at Pilate's seat of judgment. Crucify, crucify. And you wonder... Is it my time? But then you hear your name, Barabbas, being repeated over and over and over again. Barabbas. Barabbas. In the connotation of being released. Can it be? And before long, you hear the jingle of keys. The bars are opened. And your name is called forth. And as you step forward, your chains are loosed. And you're told, you're free. And you have to be wondering... How is this possible? I was to be scourged. I was to be hung up on a cross, a public spectacle. Because you know you're deserving of it. 
You're unjust. You're guilty. You're the enemy not only of the state of Rome, but you're an enemy of, to God. You have committed awful sins. And yet, you just find out you're a free man. And perhaps, we it's not recorded for us, but putting myself in Barabbas' place, I would want to know, when am I being released? Who's taking my place? And it's because Jesus, and whether Barabbas knew the name Jesus or not, it's not revealed, but Jesus too was well known. Jesus too was notorious in that sense. His deeds went far and wide of the good that he had done. Jesus the innocent is delivered to the punishment of death, while the guilty, the deserving of death, is released and thus given new life. It's not recorded for us where Barabbas goes or what he does after his chains are loosed and he's set free. But putting ourselves in his sandals, perhaps we would ask, who took my place? And they would say, Jesus. And we could hear in the courtyard where the fevered cry goes, crucify, crucify. And we might ask the question, what did he do? We say, oh, what he must have done to deserve my death. And as we look in Matthew 11, 2 through 5, it's things quoted there from Isaiah 35, 4 through 6, and we look in Matthew 15, 30 through 31. The answer of what did he do? He healed the blind. He healed the lame. He healed lepers and the diseased. He healed the deaf and the mute. He healed the crippled and made them whole. He raised the dead and he preached the good news of the kingdom. And yet perhaps as Barabbas, we hear Pilate say from Luke 23, 14, you brought this man to me as one who incites the people to rebellion. And behold, having examined him before you, I have found no guilt in this man regarding the charges which you make against him. The Jews brought charges against Jesus, the very charges that Barabbas had actually committed. And yet, Barabbas would have heard his name in the courtyard when he says, Who do you want me to release to you? Barabbas. Barabbas. What do I do with Jesus? Crucify. Crucify. Perhaps as Barabbas, you see the guards drag this Jesus of Nazareth to the post where they tie him and they scourge him, knowing he is innocent. Six times through Luke chapter 23, Jesus' innocence is declared. Four times by Pilate, once by a thief crucified at his side, and another time by the centurion standing at his feet. In verse 4 of Luke 23, 1 Peter 3.18 already told us he is the just or the righteous. Luke 23 verse 4, Pilate says, I find no guilt in this man. Verse 14, I have found no guilt in this man. Verse 15, no, nor has Herod. <clears throat> Herod examined Jesus. No, nor has Herod. Nothing deserving death has been done by him. Then in verse 41, or in verse 22, Pilate again says, I have found in him no guilt demanding death. Verse 41, as he hangs on his cross, the thief hung beside him says, this man has done nothing wrong. In fact, he's going to tell the other thief that's mocking him, we are getting what we deserve. But this man is innocent. In verse 47, right after verse 46, where it says he breathed his last, the centurion says, certainly this man was innocent. Luke is pointing us to the direction from Luke chapter 23 that Jesus was innocent. Barabbas was guilty. Barabbas was deserving of this death. And yet as, our, as Barabbas, we see another man dragged and tied to a post. This man that we heard Pilate say is innocent four times. And we see the Romans scourge him. And the Romans had no, no cap to the scourging they could give as the Jews did. The Jews were not allowed to give more than 40, so they often counted up to 39 just in case they miscounted. The Romans, secular historians tell us, scourged head to toe, front and back. And then... We see that man weakened by the scourge. Josephus, the historian, once told us 
Most people didn't survive the Roman scourge. That after a scourging, one's insides were on the outside. And he described graphically something that he himself witnessed. And so as Barabbas, through Barabbas' eyes, we see Jesus scourged. We see him condemned as a sinner, condemned to die. We see the crossbeam that I was to carry placed on his shoulders. So weakened, in fact, we can read in the Gospel account that another man, Simon of Cyrene, is asked to carry the cross. And there as he carries that cross to the streets in shame, as some of the hymns we sing say, he was lifted high and crucified among criminals. Crucifixion was the Roman execution reserved for the basest of criminals. And there he's crucified with two thieves, one on each side of him. He died for the sins of the world. But as Barabbas, we could see him, we could just hear him saying, he did that for me. He took the whipping that was reserved for me. He carried the cross beam reserved for me and my companions. Remember, Mark 15 tells us Barabbas wasn't the only insurrectionist caught. There were others in that dungeon. Barabbas being the most well-known, perhaps that's why he was released. The Matthew 27, 26, Mark 15, 15, Luke 23, 24 to 26, and verses 32 to 33, and John 19, 14 to 18. Jesus, the just. Jesus Christ, the innocent, the Son of God, was slain for the sins of the world. We can read in Luke 23, 25, where after they're demanding with a fevered pitch, crucify, crucify, says, says of Pilate, and he released the man they were asking for who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder. But he delivered Jesus to their will. What was their will? Crucify, crucify. As Barabbas we see this man forced to carry his cross to his death. It's the very cross beam we imagined ourselves carrying only moments earlier. And we say to ourselves, that's my death, he's dying. Barabbas is perhaps the one person in history who could say Jesus literally carried his cross. Jesus took his death. And Barnabas was given the freedom Jesus deserved. But we read in 1 Peter 3.18, for Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that He might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. Jesus the just died for the unjust. We don't know where Barabbas goes after this. He's lost to us in history. He's lost to us in the record. Because the point was that he was the guilty party. He was the guilty one deserving of death, and Jesus took his place. But then, why do I say I heart Barabbas? In a very real sense, we are like Barabbas. If Barabbas wasn't set free, what hope would I have? I say I heart Barabbas because if Barabbas wasn't set free, I wouldn't be set free. I want you to think about the similarities that we share. In Romans 5, 6-10, to 10, I hope it's not too small on the slide, it says, for while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. Paul's no longer talking about Barabbas. He's talking about everyone, Jew and Gentile alike. He says, Christ died for us. He took our death. He took our stripes. Verse 9, Much more than having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through Him. We were deserving of the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. Romans 5, 6-10 says, We were helpless. We were ungodly. We were a sinner. We were deserving wrath. We were enemies. Similarly, we could turn over to Ephesians 2, 1 to 3. And we can read there that we are dead in sin, in open rebellion to God, sons of disobedience, living according to lust, children of wrath. 
Again, the deserving of death, deserving that wrath from God. We share in common with Barabbas that we were the unjust. We were the guilty party. We're the enemy. The enemy of God. The enemy of Christ. Imagine, as we walk through what might have been going through Barabbas' mind, imagine as he is told who Jesus is and realizing he's his enemy. And his enemy went to the cross for him. And then putting ourselves in that place after reading Romans chapter 5, 6 through 10. We are that enemy. And Jesus Christ, out of his love for us, took our stripes, as it was mentioned at the Lord's table this morning by Brother Tony. Peter later says, as what Isaiah 53 says, by his stripes we were healed. And so we find that even though we fit the bill of these four things the same as Barabbas did, we also fit the bill of being set free. And in fact, even further than that, we're made alive. I want you to read with me Ephesians 2, 4 through 7. After verses 1 through 3 that remind us our helpless state, that we were in, dead in our sins, sons of disobedience, children of wrath. It says, but God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. We could ask, Jesus, why did you take the scourging? Why did you take the cross? He's saying to the whole world, I love you this much. Paul says that to us in Ephesians 2, 4 through 7. Rich in mercy because of his great love. Verse 5, <clears throat> even when we were dead in our transgressions, going back to verses 1 through 3, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. That grace was that mercy. We were deserving of that death. But he had mercy on us. And the innocent, the just, took our place. And verse 6 says, And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Again, mentioning grace, that mercy and kindness that He had toward us. Not to Barabbas only, but to us. But just as it could be said of Barabbas, it can be said of us. Jesus the innocent is delivered over to the punishment of death, while the guilty, it's me, the one deserving of death, is released and given new life. Jesus went to His death. And Barabbas was given the freedom Jesus deserved. Pilate announced it. He's innocent. He's guiltless in this matter. He's not deserving of any of the crimes that you said. And he's certainly not deserving of death. But yet Pilate caved to the crowd. Even knowing their motivation was envy. When it became a fevered pitch, release for us Barabbas. What do I do with Jesus? Crucify. Crucify. We read there, he gave him the one who was in prison for murder and insurrection. The very charge they laid against Jesus. And he delivered Jesus to their will. Jesus went to his death. And in a very real physical sense, Barabbas was given the freedom Jesus deserved. Pilate sought to release Jesus. But not hard enough. In his position of authority and power, he had to just say, it is done. And release him. But he wanted to please the people. Jesus went to his death and I, you and me, were given the freedom Jesus deserved. I am the one so clearly guilty and deserving of condemnation. This was prophesied in Isaiah 53 verse 8 where it says of us in Isaiah 53 verse 8, by oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living... For the transgression of my people, to whom the stroke was due. We are those people to whom the stroke was due. And yet he stood in your place. He stood in my place, just as he stood in Barabbas' place. In Mark 2.17, it says, In hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Jesus Christ came to be that great physician. And taking those stripes, 
to whom the stroke was due us, he healed us. He set us free and he made us alive in him. It was mentioned, the Lord's table, a few songs that bring to remembrance the sacrifice that he made. One of those that springs to my mind is O Sacred Head. It is in our songbook, our hymn book, number 224, but the second stanza is missing out of our hymn book. So I have it on the slide for you to read with me. The original second stanza of O Sacred Head says, What thou, my Lord, hast suffered was all for sinners' gain. Mine, mine was the transgression, but thine the deadly pain. Lo, here I follow my Savior. Tis I deserve thy place. Look on me with thy favor and grant to me thy grace. Another hymn that is in our hymn book, I invite you to turn over to 448 with me. Number 448, we're just going to read also the second stanza of How Deep the Father's Love. Stanza 2 of number 448 out of our hymnal. How Deep the Father's Love. It says, Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. And if you continue reading through the third stanza, it will remind you that his stripes paid my ransom. The message of the gospel, as we can read in 1 Peter 2, 21 to 24, is a sinner goes free and an innocent man dies. And we see that in all four of the gospels where they bear out that Jesus Christ was innocent. He was the just and he died for the unjust. My encouragement this morning as we look at such a case as we see the pages of First Peter or the words of First Peter three eighteen come to life as we read through the Gospels and the account of Barabbas and Jesus, son of the dear father versus son of the father. And the people's choice was so hypocritical to call out Barabbas, we want Barabbas. What to do with Jesus? Crucify him. Crucify him. My admonition is to trust in God. God had a plan. The people played a part in that plan, though they didn't know it. But God had a plan to save you and me, to make you and I alive in Christ, freed from our sins, freed from the guilt and the death that we so richly deserved. Run to that cross and lay hold of Jesus who loved you and who died for you. The choice is before us, Jesus or Barabbas. What do I mean by that? Jesus or Barabbas. We can choose to stay in our sins, having that freedom paid for, or we can be made alive in Christ. That's what I mean by the choice is yours. Will you choose to remain guilty and deserving of death? Or will you take hold of that freedom found in Christ? If you haven't yet this morning, obey the gospel now. What do you need to do to inherit eternal life? What do you need to do to be saved? You need to hear the gospel that Jesus Christ, the just, died in your place. Repent, believe in Him. Repent of your sins. Confess Him as Lord, making Him your new priority in life. Be baptized for the forgiveness of those sins in His name, rising from the waters, no longer guilty, but declared innocent, paid in full by the ransom paid in the blood of Jesus Christ. And live your life faithfully to Him. And this morning, if you are a Christian, having already obeyed the gospel, sometimes we need to remember the price that was paid for freedom. Sometimes we need to remember the price that was paid so that I could be made alive in Christ. And if you still are hanging on to any sins, let them go. Let them be nailed to that cross as was intended by God. And repent of those sins and you can be renewed into the flock of God today. If you're subject to an invitation in any way this morning, the waters of baptism or the prayers of the congregation on your behalf, come forward now. Let it be known now while we stand and while we sing.